Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Bet Out of Debt show. Um, I have Patrick Duarte in the building on a beautiful Sunday morning. How are you, Patrick? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? I'm How doing you? I'm doing good, good, good. We got Miss We got Miss Jams in the building. Uh, good morning, Miss Jams. I appreciate the support. Go ahead, Patrick. I'll cut you off. Uh, it's okay. It's a Halloween, so it's a bit of a spooky Sunday, or is it? Yeah, I'm. I don't know. I, I don't play the Halloween thing, my friend. But I not me neither. Well, what I will say though, Patrick, today we will be talking about the Ford Motor Company. So for those of you who may have missed Tesla, like me, there's a cheap EV play out there called Ford. And the stock is less than $20 a share. And I have made over a little over $4,000 in, in about five weeks. And so I'm going to go over Ford in more detail. And there's more money to be made there. As well as, Patrick, you're going to talk about what? I'm going to talk about EBIT, EBITDA, gross, mar gross profit margin, net profit margin. All right, Patrick, I'm going to start the show. All right, Patrick Doherty, before we get into what I want to talk about Ford, I have some video to share um, on Ford to kind of reiterate my bullish sentiment on that EV company. You know, Facebook did some amazing things this week, and we talked about Facebook just a few episodes ago, and we had this debate, and we went in a lot of detail on Facebook. Did you hear the news on Facebook changing its name? I did. Yeah. What? What is it? Meta. Yeah, it's it's Meta, and then the the symbol is almost in the sign of a of an infinity sign. Right. So they're gonna go with a whole different strategy, and Facebook stock was way way down. It's come up a little bit, but it's still way down. If you still want to do that trade in Facebook, it's still there to be done. So um, that's a show you should consider from a couple of weeks ago. If you're still interested in Facebook, I recommend that you watch it and get all of the skinny on the technicals and why we believe Facebook is a good long term buy. But today, Patrick, I want to go back to the Ford Motor Company on September the 12th. I did a long bullish show on the Ford Motor Company about the new CEO, Jim Farley, about them uh, acquiring and poaching an executive from Tesla. Uh, I think his name is Doug Fields. Uh, I'll show that in a moment. But Ford reported earnings this week. And did you hear about the Ford Motor Company earnings on Wednesday? I heard that the, the earnings were, were spectacular. And I saw the I saw the stock reaction as a result in the aftermarket, the after hours market. Yeah, it was crazy. And what was crazy about it is we were talking Ford on September the twelfth. Ford at the time was in the low twelve, right at eleven dollars per share. Ford actually dipped to eleven something a share. And now Ford is around seventeen dollars a share. And climbing, but let's let me show you some of the the reports out the report out on that we uh, that they were advertising on television on uh, the Ford Motor Company from this past Wednesday. So let me share what I have here. Hold on for a second. 
Hey, Melissa, not only did Ford beat the street, they smashed the earnings expectations. Take a look at the chart of Ford shares after it reported earnings. The reason for the pop higher, reporting earnings of 51 cents a share. The street was expecting 27 cents a share. Forget about the fact that revenue was a smidge under expectations, coming in at $32.2 billion. Nobody's paying attention to that right now. It's the earnings beat by what? 24 cents? I mean, it's, it's a huge beat there. Their earnings adjusted EBIT margin. 10 point, or it's going to be 8.4%. Here's the guidance. Let's talk about this. Stronger Q4 sales. They're going to be raising their 2021 profit target. The new full year even adjusted profit target is 10.5 to $11.5 billion. Previously, it was 9 to $10 billion. That's another reason why shares move higher. What about the chip outlook? This got a fair number of questions with the CFO during a media call just a few minutes ago. During that call, he said, look, it is improving, and it certainly is going to improve in the fourth quarter compared to the third quarter, but the shortage, it will last through 2022. It will decrease in intensity, but it will last through 2022, and he also said it may linger into 2023. That hasn't spooked people because the stock is still holding up after hours. As you take a look at shares of Ford, a couple other notes here. One. It expects 40 to $45 billion in CapEx spending between now and 2025, with only $15 billion of that being for the BEV, the battery electric vehicle investments that they've already outlined, the $30 billion. So there's substantial investments that Ford will be making over the next four years. No change in its full year adjusted free cash flow guidance, still in that range of 4 to $5 billion. And finally, the company will be reinstating its quarterly dividend. It will be $0.10 cents a share for shareholders who are of record on November 19th. Remember, Melissa, they got rid of the dividend in March of last year, right when the pandemic was beginning, because they wanted to conserve cash. They had no idea what would happen. And look, they needed to save that cash at that time, but now they have reinstated it, $0.10 cents a share for those who are of record on November 19th. Melissa? So the quality of... So... So, Patrick, they reinstated the dividend on Ford stock. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that it's going to earn passive income, and that makes it the stock even that much more attractive. Exactly. Very attractive. So, and that clip there was from Wednesday. Uh, as of Friday, Ford is above $17 a share. So, and they mentioned EBIT, the EBIT raising a guidance on EBIT. You're going to go into EBIT in a few moments here, but let me share some additional footage on the Ford Motor Company from Wednesday. Here's another short clip. Hey, Guy, what does this tell you about whether Ford or GM is a better investment? I think it's Ford. Um, but yeah, you, maybe you're splitting hairs, but I do think it's Ford, and you can make. And we've talked about this now for a while. Just that on valuation alone, a lot of people say you you know you don't buy autos when they're cheap, and I get it. But one of the points we made is you can get to the point where they're just too cheap, and I think that's where we are with Ford. For example, Credit Suisse, I think on October 20th, just raised their price target to twenty dollars. I think that puts them high in the street. Prior to that, I think the range was between eleven and eighteen. I mentioned that because. I guarantee over the next couple trading days, you're going to see analysts ratchet up their numbers on valuation. So you just put a 10 multiple on the buck 80 or so they're going to earn. And by the way, it's probably going to be more than that next year. You're talking about an 18 to $20 stock. I think that's where it's going. So for me, it's Ford Mill. So right there, and I, I like Guy Adami. Uh, he's mm -hmm. one of my faves. Um, and so if you miss Tesla, or if you do not have the big $1,100 a share to buy Tesla, you can buy Ford, who is transitioning over to an EV stock. And when we talked about Ford on our September the 12th, 12th episode, mm -hmm. Ford was being, I think the P.E. ratio then was around seven times the earnings per share. Ford is already up to 10 times earnings per share and it's going to continue to grow based and on that's that still very cheap that is exactly still very cheap now you mentioned something a minute ago patrick you mentioned with the dividend they're making money from their investments listen to what tim seymour had to say 
about Ford's investment. And you would be surprised what they're about to do here. Check this out. Well, certainly when you talk about semiconductors and second quarter shipments up 67% over uh, uh, third quarter, excuse me, up 67% over second quarter. I mean, Ford is, Ford is able to talk about a softening. And despite the fact that they're being cautious on the outlook, this is not what you heard out of GM. The fact that, look, they, they crushed their numbers. They didn't just, you know, beat the street. They, they absolutely destroyed the number. And I think you know, that tells people also where uh, maybe they've been more conservative. They've reiterated this 40 to 45 billion in expenditures, or maybe they've actually underscored that. And, and I think that also just shows the commitment they have to both EV and, and some of the technologies that I think are really part of what are giving Ford uh, a boost here. But uh, are they better run than GM? Hard to know. In terms of historically, uh, arguably, GM was the one that cut loss-leading businesses faster than Ford and I think improved a lot of the elements of, of uh, essentially the production chain. This is a very exciting day for Ford uh, during difficult times. And you know they can talk about commodity costs being higher, et cetera. No big deal here. Um, also began to talk about things like Rivian, which we talked about the other night, and probably didn't pay attention to the fact that Ford owns a chunk of Rivian. Um, some of their investments in EV and other technologies are also paying off and accreting to the valuation here. Patrick, did you hear that? I did. I did. Ford owns a big chunk of whom? Rivian. People didn't know that. This executive team with Ford is a different team. So when you look at the charts of Ford and you go and look at that 200-day moving average and you see Ford below the 200-day moving average up until the new CEO takes over, boom. So they're making money on their investments too. Now, I mentioned earlier that Ford poached Doug Fields from Tesla and Apple. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this Doug Fields guy was the head of the whole new Apple car. I'll show you him in a moment. But check out what Ford is transitioning to for the future. Check this clip out from Phil LeBeau. Shares of Ford in the after hour session climbing, they are now up by about 7%. Let's get back to Phil, who's got fresh commentary from that conference call 36 minutes in. Phil. Hey, Melissa, you talk about a strong earnings call with analysts. That's what we're hearing from Ford right now between uh, CEO Jim Farley and CFO uh, Jim Lawler. Uh, what you're hearing is a very strong uh, representation of where they believe, believe Ford is right now and where it is headed. In fact, a couple of comments, they were asked about 2022. They both said that they believe that it will be uh, a strong year. Now, they're not putting any targets out there for 2022. We won't get that until February in terms of financial guidance. But they also believe that Ford is in the midst of a transformation. Jim Farley saying they're making strong progress in transitioning the business away from what it used to be for decades upon decades, where we build the models, we sell them to dealers, we stock these dealership lots, and then you and I go out there and we say, well, I like that F-150, yeah, I'll buy that one. They are transitioning to a model where you and I will look, whether it's at a Ford dealership or whether it's online, at a model, and we will customize it and we'll say, that's what I want. And then you go into the order bank. In fact, they were talking about how much their order bank has grown. It's that type of discussion right now with the analysts uh, that is getting a lot of attention. In terms of the chip supply, by the way, Melissa, they were asked how much do they expect it to improve. And they said, well, probably about 10% next year, but they expect the severity of the chip shortage to ease as it goes throughout the year. So while they do expect it to last through all of 2022, they expect the severity of the crunch to ease sequentially as you go month by month throughout the, the year. Melissa, back to you. Okay, Patrick. What do you hear there, my friend? What I hear there is that they're changing their inventory structure and the way you can order your cars. See, um, before Jim Farley took over the company, it was just your typical, you know, build them, uh, whatever car you have, and, you know, who cares about the demand? And then they're kind of imposing their, the, 
you know, the the product mix on the consumer and the consumer will say, okay, well, I guess I, I, that's the closest to what I want. Whereas this time, uh, you could go into the dealer and customize what you want. So what that does is it lowers the cost of inventory and it becomes more of a just in time inventory model. This is what, um, Walmart did in the 1990s. And that's what put them well ahead of its competition because it was a just just in time inventory structure, and it's just very similar to you know like a like a like Lamborghini. Lamborghini is very very well run, and you can go into a Lamborghini dealership. You can pick your color, you can pick your model, and you know if you may have to wait a little while because of the shortage of uh, of Lamborghini cars, but Lamborghini has just been killing it because of that. And Ford is following the similar model. Just and, in time of the Yeah, and there's a company that do not have any car dealerships. Well, let me put it this way. There's a company, an EV company, that have showroom dealerships but do not carry inventory. And they're the number one EV company in the world. And that is Tesla. Yes. And guess who Ford, I, I, I will reiterate it again. Ford poached the top Tesla guy who left Tesla and went over to Apple to create the Apple car, the Titan, Project Titan, which is supposed to come out in 2024-ish. They just poached him recently. And so you see these shifts in the way they're doing business and they have executives, they have experience, and then they have the backing of the whole Ford Motor Company. Now, I want you to check this out. This is another clip. So, Melissa Lee goes to uh, Adami, guy Adami, and asks, hey, Ford stock is up 70% since the beginning of the year. Can Ford stock continues to go up? Can it continue? And I'm in line with Guy here. Check this out. As Phil is talking, shares continue to climb up 7.8%. Guy, is it possible for a stock that has gone up 77% year to date for it to warrant a further re-rating? I think so. I, I absolutely. I, again, I'll say it, and you can fast fire me next week, but you're going to see analysts over the next couple of trading days raise their price targets. I would imagine anywhere from 18 to 25. Uh, can it go higher? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I think this price now, 1670, makes it a six year high. I think the last time we saw this, I think was March of 2015 or something. So I think people are going to have to re rate the name, and I think you're going to see it continue to grind higher. All right, coming up. So, so there we go, Patrick. And, and I'm a believer too. So, and again, guys, we talked about this stock at the beginning of September, September the 12th. Here we are uh, going through October. I'm still reiterating by forward. It's only $17 a share. You could buy Tesla too at $1,100 a share and you will make your money. But Ford is the up and comer if you do not have that type of money to buy per share. That is the point. Um, let me show something else, Patrick. Let me show you this guy, Doug Field. Let me show you some of his pedigree here. So let me see if I can get Doug up here. Hold on for a second. Let's see. May I add something too? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sharing Doug Field's kind of okay. resume. But go ahead, Patrick. Let me let me come back to you for a second. Hold on for a second, Patrick. Go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> and I think... The, this new with this new inventory method that Ford has adopted, you can better control quality. So you're going to get better customer satisfaction going forward. Great point. Let let me share Doug Field. Who is Doug Field? Look at it. He began his career in Ford, and we talked about this on September the twelfth. Was with Apple. Got poached and went to Tesla and became a senior VP. He is the the guy who led the Model Three implementation. Implementation. Thank you. Um, 
And then after that, Apple poached them for Project Titan for the Apple car, which is supposed to come out in 2024. But then Ford came back and poached Doug Field back to Ford. So you see some of these models that where Ford is going and you, you, you say, wait a minute, this guy's been in the board room of all of these different companies from for Apple to Tesla to Ford to he and he is leading the EV space over here in Ford, the, the technology chief. So, man, it's just a, a great opportunity for those who will want to get into the Ford Motor Company on a small pullback. Stop buying you some Ford stock and I think you'll do well. And if you really want to leverage, you may want to consider a Ford call option. That's what I did. And that's how I was able to get that like four grand over the last five and a half weeks or so. So uh, and I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue to ride forward. Thoughts, Patrick? Yes. So and if you want if you're interested in buying Ford and I think I'm leaning that way, too, which you may want to do. Um, if you really like the fundamentals, is you might you might buy just a little bit right now. You just buy bits and pieces. You don't buy it all at once. And then, as the stock might come down on the pullback, then you can buy a little bit more. But it's probably even at sixteen to seventeen dollars a share. Um, it's probably still a really good price to start buying a little bit and just you know every every uh, paycheck, part of your paycheck or whatever sources of income. You could just peel off, like say, like buy ten shares. That's one hundred sixty, one hundred seventy dollars. Yes. Yeah, and, and they just had their earnings on Wednesday. Ford is projected to continue to grow. Right. And, and they're coming out. They're going EV, and so their price right now, based on execution for the future. Once they prove they can execute. Their earnings per share multiple, which is the P.E. ratio, is going to go up even more. Right now, their P.E. ratio is only 10. So you're getting the price of this stock at 10 times the earnings per share. Even if the earnings per share stayed the same, which is not, the market is going to start paying 20 times earnings per share. You've just doubled the stock, even though the, 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 the company... Is earning the same per share, which is not. But the point is, is the earning per share is going to go up. What the market is willing to pay for the company, which is P.E., is going to go up. And those two expansions is a really compelling tailwind for the Ford Motor Company. I'm still buying stock. When it dips, I'm going to do more call options. And Patrick, in the future, we're going to have to go over our call option strategy because we're yes. pretty successful on buying that the money and selling the short 85% probability out of the money. It's typically what we do, six yes. months expiration. So yes. we should spend some detail because people buying stock is the risk free way, the, the less risky way to. Uh, you know, to trade, to make money, to place a bet, if you will. But if you really want to leverage and make the bigger money, then you do options. But options carries considerably, considerably more risk. So, And options are not for everyone. <laughs> Definitely. It's a very complex strategy. But yeah, Patrick, I kind of wanted to share that. And for those who do not believe, go back to September the 12th. And look at that Ford episode that, I mean, I went into real a lot of additional detail on September the 12th, going over the Ford Motor Company. And I am even more bullish today. So, Patrick. Yeah. I, go ahead. Yeah. So, I, I I mean, I don't have any shares of Ford yet, but I'm thinking of, you know, I'll, again, I'm going to buy a little bit. Yeah. And then um, as it comes down to maybe a more attractive level because of its run up, um, I'll buy more. Yeah. Maybe do a maybe do a, a call a call spread, some kind of spread um, um, stock strategy or option strategy. 
okay. as it gets as it gets to the bottom end of the Bollinger Band. Uh, uh, I miss jams. I'm just getting to some of the comments here. Miss Jam um, is making some comments about the Corvette. And then um, also a comment. When was Ford at its higher share price? Over a hundred dollars, for example. I don't know. I haven't haven't looked at Ford share price uh, historically. I know that I believe eighteen dollars a share has been a ceiling for Ford. So once they break through the eighteen dollars per share mark, that's been kind of resistance. Once they break through that, then the sky's the limit. But I'm not sure. I would have to go back and kind of Google. Good questions, though. Yeah, very good question. So, hey, Patrick. Um, and I'm a big fan of the Corvette. My brother actually just bought a brand new Corvette. My brother Tony brought, just bought one brand new out of the showroom. I've been considering buying one myself. But, Patrick, in the Ford... Uh, releases that we just talked about. They talked about EBIT and EBITDA. Yeah. Can, you, can you share with our audience what is EBIT, what is EBITDA? You are an accountant. You know this stuff. If you can speak that stuff, and then what I'll do is interject with some questions because oftentimes, Patrick, you can go so deep in this stuff, you can go completely over my head. So will you share what EBIT and EBITDA is in terms of all of this financial jargon? Yeah, indeed. No problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share an article, and then it would kind of describes what it is so that uh, people can visualize and, and read along with me what EBIT is. So can, can, you, share this? can you see the screen here? Uh, let me get here, Patrick. Hold on for a sec. Let me get you in here. Hold on, Patrick. Let me see. I'm having a slight technical difficulty. Let me see if I can get you up, Patrick. Hold on. I'm on the wrong screen. That's what it is. Now we have you, Patrick. Go ahead, please. Okay, so this is an article by Seeking Alpha, and I think it does a pretty good just explanation as to what EBIT is. So EBIT is the acronym for earnings before interest and taxes. EBIT is, so this is an income statement line relating to the profitability of a company's business. EBIT may also be referred to as profit before interest and taxes. It is often uh, conflated with operating income, but has some key differences that is going to be reviewed. Now, what EBIT is, business owners and investors frequently pay attention to EBIT, which is the company's earnings before interest and taxes. EBIT appears on the company's income statement, and it's a measurement that assists business owners and investors in assessing profitability. EBIT answers the question of how much of the company's revenues remain after operating expenses are deducted. So if a company's EBIT is negative, managers will have to curb expenses or increase revenues that have a chance of becoming profitable. So here's, the, here's a, um, a calculation of what EBIT is. So... The EBIT formula and calculation, the EBIT for formula subtracts the cost of goods sold. So in trying to come, come to um, gross profit revenue, so that's the gross revenue. And then you subtract your operating expenses. Now, the cost of goods sold is found on the income statement just below revenues. So it's essentially, in a nutshell, without going through the, you know, too, too far into the, to the article yet, it's the cost. So you have your net revenue, and then so, you're well, going to well, have one second. You say you have your net revenue. Oh yeah, so you have your gross revenue. I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, your you know, gross revenue. So so just for our audience, so that people do not get confused by all of this jargon. 
revenue is just a fancy word for sales. sales. For sales, exactly. Right. So as we use this term gross revenues, we're talking about gross sale of something at retail. Okay. Yeah, something at the po point of sale, like when you go into a, um, a Walmart and then you, you know. You buy it at retail. Product. Retail price, that's gross revenue, gross sales. Okay. Now, right. what is COGS? Because I'm looking at the formula right here on the screen. EBIT, earnings before interest and tax, is equal yes. to gross sales or revenues minus gross. minus COGS. What is Which COGS? Is cost. Okay, cost of goods sold is the cost of producing the goods that have been sold to create that gross revenue. For example, let's just say Acme Widget Store spends one dollar to create a widget. No, no, no. Let's let's go real. Let's go with my e-bike shop. Let's say okay. say the e-bike shop that I own. Let's say a e-bike costs me. $500 to procure, but yes. I can sell an e-bike for $1,000. Yes. What is cost, cost of goods sold? What is that? Then your cost of goods sold uh, would be the $500 it cost you per unit that you just sold. So if let's just say in this example, you sold one e-bike for $1,000 um, and it cost you five hundred dollars to 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 procure that um that that e-bike your cost of goods sold there is five hundred dollars now does cost a good soul include my employees that's working in the store to sell the e-bike does it include the lights and electricity in the building or is it just the purchase of the bike from the supplier itself. It's just the purchase of the bike of the supplier itself in a merchandising business. So the the lights, the rent, the salaries, um, those are considered operating expenses. Ah, that's next. That's next on the list in the EBIT formula. Okay, continue. Exactly. Continue, Patrick, please. I yes. So uh, I'll continue with this example again. Um, let's just say that some widget store make a, a million widgets in a quarter, but sell 800 of these widgets for the price of $2 a widget. The gross revenue is 1600 while the or six one point six million, while the cost of goods sold reported is eight hundred thousand. So that's your cost of goods sold. On top, they spend twelve hundred to a twelve thousand per quarter in rent. So that's not your cost of goods sold, and twenty thousand in sales and marketing. So that's not your cost of goods sold. That's more uh, operating expenses. Gotcha. And they were saying that we probably need to blow that up a little bit in the future, Patrick. But gotcha. OK. OK, so that's EBIT. EBIT. Earnings, which is profits. Yes. Before you deduct, interest. before you deduct interest and taxes. And the reason why you do not include interest and taxes is that interest and taxes are not considered operating expenses. Only a, an accountant would know all of this gibberish. Okay. And so, so what does, what does EBIT give me? EBIT, does EBIT allow me to compare one company to another? It levels the playing field. Is that what EBIT does? Well, what EBIT does, it it, 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 it it determines what your operating profits are. So what it would do is it would allow you to compare uh, companies within an industry 
So it's a better measure to see how profitable from your normal business operations a company is um, in a particular industry. Gotcha. So you might want to look at the semiconductor industry. Right. So you can't compare two different industries. You compare two companies in the same industry and you take out that interest in taxes and you can just look at the gross sales and profits and I mean, yes. gross costs. Okay. All right. Gotcha. So what about EBITDA? EBITDA. EBIT, EBITDA uh, looks at... Uh, interest now that's taking out non-cash expenses such as depreciation and amortization so it's a closer measure of cash flow than ebit is so let me delve into that in this article here so if i may share my screen here give me one moment So this is so I, mean, I should probably blow this up a little bit. Yes, uh, let's do that. Okay, so um, that's what I've done. Okay. So this is an article in Investopedia, and we're taking a clear look at E B I T D as a delta, R A as an alpha. Okay, so normally investors focus on cash flow, net income, and revenues as the basic measures of a corporate health and value. But over the years, another measure has crept into quarterly reports and accounts. Earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, or EBITDA. While investors can use EBITDA to analyze and compare profitability between companies and industries, they should understand there might be some uh, limitations to, that can tell them about a company. And here we, this is what the. Hold on. We all right. All right. I got your sound back. Sorry. Your sound disappeared for a second. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So I was just saying. I'll cut to the chase. So EBITDA is equal to basically your net profit. So basically your your bottom line. Then you're adding back interest. You're adding back taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Because these are considered, uh, well, the interest and taxes are considered non-operating income or, or expenses. And depreciation and amortization are considered non-cash charges. So essentially, EBITDA uh, looks at the cash flow of the business. Like, what are the cash expenses? What are the, what is the cash um, operating profit? Is what I like to um, refer to that as. And I'll stop sharing that. Now, Patrick, can you go back to the advantages? Can you go back to sharing for a second? Because there were some advantages there, some takeaways. Okay, I, I would like to kind of look at those takeaways if we could. Okay. For EBITDA. I think those takeaways are, are very important. Okay, so uh, you want to go back up to here? Key takeaways. Yeah. Let's, let's go through some of these takeaways, Patrick. Okay. So earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization is a metric that measures a company's overall financial performance. So what that means is how are the operating profits before your depreciation, so depreciation and amortization? And again, depreciation and amortization are non-cash charges. Um, Essentially, when you buy a piece of equipment um, for over a long period of time, you're going to use that equipment in your line of business. So when you first purchase this, purchase this, this is a, an investing cash outflow, but and it's not necessarily an expense when you first buy it. However, um, 
because of the appreciate, you know, using this equipment over a period of time, um, it becomes worth less and less and less because of, uh, you know, you're using it and it becomes, you know, through your usual wear and tear. And as a result, it depreciates, it goes down in value and market value and, and it goes down in book value. So as a result, this is, this expense has to be accounted for, but it is not a cash charge because you've already bought this piece of equipment and all you're doing is just, you're just um, reevaluating this equipment uh, after every quarter. Gotcha. Can you blow that up some, Patrick, and let's continue. Okay. I'll blow it up a little bit more. Thank you. And um, EBITDA is now commonly used to compare the financial health of companies and evaluate firms with different tax rates and depreciation policies. And some of its drawbacks are that EBITDA is not a substitute for analyzing a company's cash flow and can make a company look like it has more money to make interest payment than it really does. So that's where you go into the cash flow statement where you look at the investing and financial sources of cash. And I think we went over that in a uh, previous video. Uh, the EBITDA also ignores the quality of a company's earnings and it can make it look cheaper than it really is. So essentially, um, it doesn't really analyze, you know, the, you know, how the company really uh, accounts for some of these, um, you know, some of these sales that could, it could be manipulated to a certain extent, whereas cash flows cannot be manipulated. Can you, can you go to the top? You missed a second from the top. Oh, this right yeah. here in the mid 1980s, investors began to use EBITDA to determine if a distressed company would be able to pay back the interest on a leveraged buyout deal. Oh, okay. So that's essentially, um, you know, for those looking for takeover targets, I suppose, or those interested in M&A merchant gotcha. acquisitions. Gotcha. I mean, it, Right now, I think for our own purposes, it's not really that important to, to really look. That's, a, you know, an important use of looking at EBITDA. I think we, when you want to look at EBITDA, you want to see, you know, how much the company is generating before depreciation and amortization, since those are non-cash charges. That's the key takeaway. All right. All right, Patrick, we can stop sharing. I kind of pulled this back up. So, I mean, that's kind of where we are. I talked very bullishly about the Boeing, I mean, the Ford Motor Company. Um, you and, and within those reporting clips that I showed, they were talking EBIT and EBITDA. Yes. So we know what that is now. Patrick, do we want to share a trade? Because there is a trade out there that's a screaming trade. I am in it. And is still there for the taking. And do you know what that is? I'm giving you the. Oh, okay. You're talking about Visa. Right. The letter V. The letter V. Visa. Uh, all right. Let's get into it. Yeah. Let me show you this when I'm looking at right now. I'm already in this trade and I'm, I'm about to probably put some more up on this trade. So let me see if I hold on for a second, Patrick. I, bring my screen back here and uh there we go patrick uh, i think i'm sharing my screen here uh yeah i don't have my multiple screen situation going here so it makes it a little more difficult but okay. where i'm at is um barchart.com and let me pull this up and try to get it on the screen here all right let's see uh, hold on for a second all right patrick um 
Let me get this up on the screen here. I have mm -hmm. Visa. So I'm, I'm also looking at it. Okay. So on barchart.com, mm -hmm. uh, you go to interactive charts, click yep. on it. And I have it already programmed, right? But you have your frequencies and all of that. Let me change my little chart situation over here. See if I can change my little chart situation to just the 200 day moving average. I want to show something here that I particularly like. And that is, and so I already have these filters templates set up. So it's easy to do, but take a look at this Patrick here. Take a look at Visa. Visa yeah. is trading right at $211 a share. I see that. And take a look at the 200, the red line, the 200 day moving average. And I, mm -hmm. we're looking at a one year period. Mm -hmm. Every time Visa has touched the 200 day moving average, it kind of bounces up and continues. And look here. Visa has come down and broke the 200 day moving average. Do you see that? I, I see that. Yeah, right to the far right really badly like the 200 yes. day moving average should be at 204 224 a share i see that visa stock price is trading at 211 dollars a share so that's like a 13 dollar discount so one could either freak out right here and say the stock is going to continue to go to zero and we're talking about visa the credit card company Mm -hmm. Or one could say this stock is heavily discounted. And if I buy it down here where it's cheap, then in the future it's going to go back up and I would make money. And so I think I'm more on the it's cheap side of the game. So I wanted to show that just in reference to the 200 day moving average, how Visa has greatly broached the 200 day moving average. So what do the analysts think of Visa? If you go to bar chart and look at what the bar chart analyst thinks, as far as the analyst ratings they have collected, based on 22 analysts as of currently, strong buy, strong buy, strong buy, strong buy. So why is Visa down so much then? Well, uh, let's look at when they reported earnings. Let's see when earnings report is. Let's blow this up a bit if I can. And so earnings, most recent earnings, 1026. And this is what they reported. And uh, there was a slight, they, they, they beat on earnings, I believe. But there's this this concern if you look at the news there's some concern about cross border transactions uh, when you look at the headlines on visa this whole cross border transaction headwinds that visa have so visa is a reopening play a reopening uh coming out of COVID play so how do you how do you play that? One could play this a couple of different ways. And let me add the Bollinger Bands in here. I'm going to add uh, one of my faves, and that is the Bollinger Bands. Let me, uh, if I can get there, interactive charts, studies, type in Bollinger Bands. And add the default settings. You can add the Bollinger Band on top of this. And as we have talked about in previous episodes, the Bollinger Band represents where the stock typically trades. And that would be 
in this rim here with the middle of the Bollinger Band, that, that middle line in the middle, and then you have your second deviation high, which is the blue above, and then you have your second deviation low, your band below the middle. Well, you can see Visa is just stretch the bottom of the Bollinger Band and is trading a few deviations away from the middle. So how do you how do you do a trade on this type of situation? What one could do is come down to this area and sell a put. And if one were to sell a put here, you would be betting a month or two from now that Visa stock price will not come this far down um, and you can make money. So how, how do you do that, Patrick? And what does that look like? So one would go and you can look at the option prices on Visa. And mm -hmm. let's let's say we were to go out. Let's look at some of the expirations on an option contract on Visa. If I were to blow this up a bit. So let's say let's say we look at let's look two months out. Let's look about uh, let's say six weeks out, maybe to the middle of December. And why would I pick December? Well, what comes in December? What is December the 25th, Patrick? Christmas. That's Christmas. Christmas. And every year in the November, December range, what happens? We have a big rally. It's called the Santa Claus rally. So stocks typically go up during that period of time. So what, yes. one, so what, what one could do, because we just saw that Visa was so low on the Bollinger Band, and Visa's trading around $211 a share. And uh, let me let me pull this out a bit so we can see this. Let's look at the option prices here. So here are the strikes, and here's the last. So we can look at what is trading at, at the last. So if I were to go with the 215 uh, at the money, 215. Yes. That would cost me on the last right here with last trade. That would cost me about five dollars and sixty cent a contract. And as we know, one contract equates to a hundred shares. So five dollars and sixty cents is essentially for one contract five hundred and sixty dollars. So you can buy one contract at five hundred and sixty dollars betting by December the 17th, I believe, that this stock will go from the bottom of the Bollinger Band where it is and the stock will clam and continue to go above 211 and, and keep going in the upward trend. So that's one way to play this. You would buy a call at the money yes. on the expiration right here. Well, actually, I wouldn't even do this here. I will actually go out six months to give myself enough time to make sure that this trade works. So I will go out at least two earnings and um, I would go at the 215 at the money. Uh -huh. This will cost me $15.70, $15 which means $1,570. You could buy yes. this call at the money, and then you would sell a call against it. 85% probability out of the money, maybe, uh, would be. And the way you would figure that out is you would just look at the option Greeks. And then looking at option Greeks, you look for the delta. And you want to you wanna sell a call against it at the 20 delta, maybe the 16 delta. Right. I'm looking at the 16 Delta right here for 325. Uh, 325. So yeah. the strike price is at 260. Yeah. Uh, so you have some significant upside to make money. And even if you wanted to go at the 75 Delta, like here's the Delta right here, right? And let's see if we were to go. Here's the 16 Delta right here, Patrick. 16 uh -huh. Delta right here. You could sell that 260 against it. So you could take, you know, this this 325 off of the previous 15. 
and that's your trade. So there it is. There it is, right there. So if if that was a little too fast for you, then you can go on YouTube and easily learn about call spreads. But essentially, if you wanted to make big money on a big trade fairly soon, you would go out six month expiration on the June expiration, just to repeat, this is what I'm doing. Buy a call at the money, 215 at $15.70, and then buying, I mean, sorry, selling a call, 260 the 15 Delta, 16 Delta at 325 net net. I'm paying about 12 and I that would give me the ability to double my money. Yeah, 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 you'll, be, yeah you'll be buying it. Like it's about 12, 1240 for yep, that. For that $12.40. And you would reduce your risk and you can make some good money on that option call spread. Now, again, if that option play is too much, just buy Visa right now at 211 and hold it. That's the other way to do it. And as the economy reopened from this variant Delta, um, the Delta variant strand that's out there, you'll be good to go. So that's kind of what I wanted to share, Patrick. I wanted to kind of share a trade. Um, uh, you know, I, I want to help people make money, man. And, and we're making money. And that's the actual trade that I'm doing. That's one trade. And that's on the call side. The first trade that I mentioned before was the put side. So you can do a trade this way as well. Let's say if you don't want to spend money, you want to collect the money and keep it. Here's the second way you would do that, Patrick. Let me let me go through that, okay? Yeah. The second way you would do it is, all right, so let's go to Visa. Let's change this expiration and let's go out. Like I was previously saying, let's go out about six weeks. So let's go out to December the 17th. And so what I would do, instead of being on the call side, I would go on the put side and I would go around 190. And why did I pick 190? Because let me go and show you something here. Let me blow this up. On bar chart, it gives you the Greeks. And where are the Greeks on this sucker? Here's the Greeks. Greeks, here we go, the Greeks. And man, I make a lot of money doing this way as well. So on the Greeks, um, look at 190, 190, yeah. look at the Delta. Yes. It's like the point, just the 13 Delta, right? This is, yeah, 13.6. Yeah, so I'm at approximately the 15 Delta. What does this mean? This means I got only a 13% chance to lose. That's what the Delta mean. Only got a 13% chance to lose. That's what that means. I got a 87% yes. chance to win this trade. So I would do, I would do um, the 190 Delta. Uh, this is where I would sell my put. I want to have an 87% chance, an 85% chance of winning this trade, right? So I would yeah. sell my put there. You could take more chance and have a 25% chance of losing or a 75% chance to win. But I I, I, I like a 85, approximately 85% chance. So I would go at the 13 Delta, meaning I only have a 13% chance to lose. I would sell at the 190. And so let me go and show you what that looks like. So I'll go to option price. And that's a cash cash secured put. Yeah. So, well, I'm going to do a spread here, Patrick. I'm not going to put up big uh -huh. money. So what I would do is I would go here and I could sell. I could literally sell this put for a dollar and 59. What does that mean? That means if I was to sell one contract, I would collect $159. And if Visa remains above $190 a share, which is currently trading at $211, but on December the 17th, if Visa stays above $190, if I were to sell a put, I would keep this $159. That's what selling a put means, right? 
Yes, exactly. But I wouldn't sell one put, Patrick. No, I'm I'm not gonna take that kind of risk for hundred and fifty nine dollars. I would sell ten puts. I would I, I sell typically in lots of ten. So mm -hmm. right here, I would collect one thousand five hundred and ninety dollars. That would be my bet, which is my investment. Bet is just a metaphor for investment. That right. would be my bet. One fifty nine. I would collect one thousand five hundred and ninety dollars, approximately sixteen hundred dollars, and I will place that bet that Visa is going to stay above one ninety a share by December the seventeenth. That is price is oversold, and what gives me confidence on that, Patrick? If I were to do that trade, what gives me confidence on that is look at Visa down here, Visa. This is where Visa normally trades, right there on the black line in the middle. That is that is called a 20-day moving average. It tracks where a stock typically likes to trade. Visa is so far below where it typically trades that I feel that is almost impossible to get down to 190. So I'm willing to sell a put here and sell 10 of them. To say it's not going to be there on the 17th. Do I have to stay in this trade, Patrick, all the way to you the don't. 17th? I do not. You don't. I do not. So when I'm up 500 bucks, like mid-November, and, and Visa is still up, I will close the trade, give them $500 back, keep $500, and I just made $500 in three weeks. So, oh, sorry, that was a $1,600 trade. I just made $800 in three weeks because I'm not going to stay there to December the 17th. And I don't have to stay in the trade. And if, once you sell the put and collect the money, each day the value of buying back that put goes down. So you collected $1,600. Every day it's cheaper to get out of the trade. So you can you can buy your way back out of the trade. So if I collected $1,600, like $1.59, when that put value is about $0.75, cent, mm -hmm. I'm going to get out of the trade. I'm going to say, I buy this back. I buy the contract back. I want to get out of the trade uh, and, and, and get out of the trade and keep my $800. And I got $800 to buy me some toys for my baby for Christmas and the stock market paid for it. So that's essentially it, Patrick. I mean, it sounds complicated, but that's kind of how it's done. It's pretty straightforward, actually. Yep. Uh, maybe. For some, it could be super, super complicated. Yeah. yeah, I guess those who are new to options. Yep. Well, that's it, Patrick, unless you have something else, because I went into a lot of detail on that Visa trade, and we'll see how it goes. On December the 17th, let's see if it's above the 190. And if I was uh, Nostradamus in this case on that trade, or if it would have paid off to buy at the money six months out and do a long call spread option. So we could we could do that. OK. All right. Yeah, if we could remember that in the future. Anything in f closing, Patrick, before we wrap her up? Um, yeah, I would just say, um, just learn your fundamentals and then, um, apply the technicals to get in and get out of us, uh, a trade, but the fundamentals will drive you in by, by the fundamentals of a company. Um, the fundamentals should be really strong. Perfect. Words to live by my friend. And as always, let's wrap her up. Okay. So that is the Bet Out of Debt show for today. And hopefully you learned something. And if you like the show, give us a like. If you have a comment, please provide it and share with those who would like to build wealth with us. We'll be here next Sunday. Uh, we call this show the Bet Out of Debt show because when you place a trade, it's called placing a bet. And hopefully it's a winner one to keep you out of debt. And as always, Take care and we will see you next Sunday. Goodbye.